Chapter 123, Seventh Year, Darkness Falls Friday the 4th of November, 1977, 2am in Gryffindor Tower I think there's something to the colour change in idea, James slurred, using his goblet to gesture wildly. Thankfully, it was empty, and it didn't spill. Nah, it's too obvious, Cyril shook his head, just as drunk as James, but handling himself remarkably well for once. Oh, besides, Lily yawned from where she sat on the floor, head nodding against James's knee. What do we change? Their robes? Their whole dormitory, Mary suggested, the only one still dancing, winding her arms slowly over her head and rolling her hips to a sultry Nina Simone track. Complete makeover! Bright pink! Why pink, though? Syria said. Some people might like pink. Ha. Huh. You're the only one, Black. Marlene pulled a face at him. She was sitting upside down in an armchair, her legs dangling over the back, long blonde hair touching the floor. Her eyes were fixed on Mary moving in front of the fireplace. They were the last few standing after Sirius's 18th birthday party, which had been over the top as usual. The only non-seventh year remaining was Christopher, who looked like he was struggling to keep his eyes open, but held on valiantly, taking notes for the Slytherin prank which they were currently brainstorming. How would we even get hold of their robes, though? Peter asked, fiddling with the label on his beer bottle. We had the same problem in first year, remember? With the itching powder. Oh yeah, James nodded. That's right. It was easier to sneak into their common room than it was to work out how the house elves organised the laundry. How did you sneak in? Marlene asked, frowning. You can't have perfected an invisibility spell by the age of eleven. Ask us no questions, and we shall tell you no lies, Marlene. Sirius winked at her. He was watching Mary dance, too, his eyes shining with intoxication. Anyway, we've decided not to do it. You decided, James corrected. It's my birthday. Not any more, it isn't. Peter threw a cushion at him. Sirius threw one back. Then James launched another, and soon enough they were all drunkenly flinging cushions back and forth, giggling dopily. <laughs> right, Marlene laughed, after deflecting a big round velvet one. I'm off to bed. She placed her hands on the carpet and flipped forward neatly. She rushed her jeans off as she got up, a bit wobbly on her feet, then headed for the girls' dorms. No! Mary grabbed her round the waist. Don't go, Miles. Dance with me! Marlene laughed lightly, but Remus caught an odd flash of annoyance in Marlene's usually placid face as she gently unwound herself from Mary and backed away. I'm sure one of the boys will oblige, she said shortly. Night all. Night, they all chorused back. Remus vaguely wondered what was going on between the two best friends, but he was too drunk and sleepy to dwell on it for very long. I think I'll go up too. Christopher was already on his feet, as though he'd been waiting for someone else to admit defeat so that he wasn't the first. Don't decide anything without me, though. I really don't think anyone's going to formulate a plan tonight, Lily yawned again. Oh, see you tomorrow, Chris. Night. The younger boy waved at all of them, in his awkward, cheery way. If no one wants to dance with me, Mary sighed, moving to turn off the record player. I suppose I'd better get in some beauty sleep too. And me, Peter got up, tossing back the dregs of his drink. And me. Lily was getting up when James pulled her into his lap, hugging her close. Don't go yet. She curled into him sleepily, and they became one unit, cocooned in the big leather armchair. Remus blinked at them blearily, and marvelled once again that they had all teased James for years about his certainty that he and Lily were made for each other. Funny how things work out. Absolutely obscene, Sirius tutted, pulling a face at the couple. Well, if that's the way the party's going, I'll follow Wormtail's example. Coming, Mooney? Yup. Rumors got up off the sofa they had been sharing, maintaining a polite and inconspicuous distance, as they had done all evening. They followed Peter up, 
and found he was locked in the bathroom, noisily brushing his teeth and gargling. Remus was exhausted, and sat on the end of his bed to wait, yawning and rubbing his eyes. "'Good birthday?' he asked Sirius. "'Brilliant,' Sirius grinned back. "'Good.' "'If we wait until Pete's asleep.' Oh, "'Bad idea, Padfoot, especially if James isn't back yet. "'Anyway, I'm knackered.' "'He yawned again, as if to prove his point. "'Another time. "'This was a bit of a white lie. "'After too many near misses, "'Rumours had been trying to limit the amount of time he spent in Sirius's bed. "'It seemed so sneaky and dishonest. <sighs> "'Another time.' Sirius sighed. Just, it's my birthday and I've barely seen you. I've been here all day. This was true, of course, but it was true of all the marauders, and Lily. You know what I mean, Sirius shook his head impatiently. Remus did know, but he didn't have a response that would please Sirius. The same issue kept coming up, and quite frankly, Remus was getting sick of it especially as there was no possible way to solve it until Sirius finally made up his mind. Tired and getting more irritable by the second, Remus got up and began to change quickly into his pyjamas. Sirius stood up and came over to him, crossing the beam of moonlight streaking the ancient floorboards. "'You're not avoiding me, are you?' he asked. "'No,' Remus muttered. "'I'm just busy. I've got a lot on.' If he'd said it once, he'd say it a thousand times. Okay, Sirius said slowly. Just, you know, Lily and James are busy too, but they still find time to... We're not Lily and James, though, are we? Remus raised an eyebrow, honestly. Sirius looked hurt. Well, no, but... That was your decision, Remus said, buttoning his nightshirt. What was it you said? Not to scream it from the rooftops. I thought you wanted it this way. I... Sirius looked lost. Remus rolled his eyes, exasperated. You said you needed time. I'm giving it to you. You can't keep whinging about it. Sirius withdrew. Remus knew he'd won, but there was no joy in the victory. Fortunately, Pete chose that moment to exit the bathroom. He made a beeline for his bed, head down, waving a lazy hand at them. Night, lads. Night, Pete, they both replied cheerily. Saturday, the 26th of November, 1977. They could get over little tiffs like that in those days. They could wake up the next morning and both be ready to wipe the slate clean, at least until next time. In the end, their desire for each other, their affection, and most of all their friendship, seemed strong enough to win out any of their problems. It was a state of being that Remus would later learn that they were taking very much for granted. On top of this, there was a war on, which may have explained quite a bit. Everyone was slightly melodramatic, and nerves were raw all around. The headlines weren't helping. Ministry raids three houses in search for forbidden artefacts. Third vampire attack in two weeks. Minister Jenkins steps down in wake of disappearances. Werewolf registry, dangerously undermanaged. Ministry Insider reveals. And that was only this week's paper. Something was going on with the Slytherins too, more than the usual classist nonsense. Over the summer, or perhaps before that, a new hierarchy seemed to have formed, creating obvious divisions in the most controversial Hogwarts house. Regulus Black had always carried a certain amount of clout, of course. The heir to the most noble, exclusive and wealthy pureblood family had been popular among his ambitious peer group since his very first day at school. In turn, he had surrounded himself with a fraction of pureblood students who seemed to grow nastier by the year. Except for Barty Crouch Jr., perhaps, who had been incredibly nasty even as a little boy. Now, in his sixth year, Regulus did nothing to dispel the rumours that he was not only a Death Eater, but in regular communication with Lord Voldemort himself. In fact, Regulus seemed to rather enjoy his increased powers, which, according to Christopher, who shared several classes with him, even some of the teachers were observing. He held himself differently. He walked with his back straight, his chin raised, a permanent smirk affixed to his pale face. Rims could hardly recognise the nervous, troubled boy that Sirius had once called Reggie. Regulus was not stupid. 
He had never once had detention, in all his time at school, and was as bright as his older brother when it came to lessons. Still, unpleasant things seemed to happen to everyone around him. The fourth-year Hufflepuff, who, rumour had it, knocked over an inkwell on Regulus's desk while he was studying in the library, was found two days later locked in a broom cupboard in the dungeons, white as a sheet and completely mute. He had been sent home to recover, and had not been seen since. The Ravenclaw Quidditch practice ran over by half an hour one afternoon due to a mix-up with the rotor, meaning that the Slytherin team's practice had to be pushed back to the following day. The next time the Ravenclaws met, they had to cancel their practice altogether, as well as postpone an upcoming match with Gryffindor, because nobody was able to touch their brooms without receiving a hundred of tiny splinters, which could only be removed by Madame Pomfrey. And the words, Mudbloods get out, had been magically carved into the chalkboard in the Muggle Studies classroom, so that the lessons had to be moved while the teachers investigated. Of course, no one ever questioned Regulus, and, as there were no witnesses to any of these crimes, nothing could be done. Everybody knew, though, everybody with any stake in the war. The increasing cruelty and prevalence of such attacks had thrown a shadow over the castle, which every student felt now, if they hadn't in previous years. It might have been the reason that so many people wanted to help the marauders plan their next prank, though that also had a lot to do with Christopher. Did you tell everyone? Remus sighed, exasperated, as a third year scuttled out of the study room, flushed and grinning, after offering his services to the cause. I, I blow up stuff all the time in potions, he had explained, without a trace of irony. Remus had assured him that James and Sirius would be thrilled to hear it. I just mentioned it to a friend, Christopher replied sheepishly. You know, a lot of people have got it in for the Slytherins. It's always a good idea to get a wide range of experience. The marauders do not outsource their pranks, Remus sniffed haughtily as they made their way back towards the tower. Well, it's it's not outsourcing, Christopher counted. It's, it's, um, collaboration. We don't collaborate either. Why not? Isn't that what we're supposed to be fighting for? Inclusion. Inclusion, yeah. Equality, yep. Prank planning cooperatives, no. Christopher snorted with laughter. Rumor smiled. Christopher had an awkward braying laugh, like a donkey. It was pretty glorious to witness. So, Christopher wheezed, catching his breath and wiping his eyes. What are your plans for Christmas? Staying here again? Hmm, maybe. Or going to the Potters. All hangs on whether or not James is going to spend it with Lily's family. Oh, Merlin, don't. Christopher pulled a face. I think I preferred it when they hated each other. Prefect meetings are so boring now, they spend the whole time talking each other up, enough to give you toothache. I think it's nice, Remus said. James has been bonkers about Lily since second year. If he can finally tell her how amazing she is, instead of telling us, then all the better. Yeah, I suppose you're right. We should all be so lucky, Christopher sighed. They were quiet for a bit after that, just walking together. As they turned the next corner, Remus realised that they hadn't passed anyone in a while. Fair enough, it was a Saturday, but it wasn't a Hogsmeade weekend, and the weather was too poor for anyone to be outside. Finally, a first year came hurrying towards them through an archway, which led to the east wing. Her eyes were big and frightened. She looked up at the two older boys. Oh, she squeaked. Don't go down there, it's horrid, and ran past them, presumably back to her house. Chris and Remus looked at each other. Chris licked his lips, then squared his shoulders slightly, setting his mouth. I am a prefect, so I'd better... I'll come with you. Remus patted his shoulder. Christopher nodded, looking very relieved. Remus wished James was there, or Sirius. They walked side by side through the archway, and found themselves enveloped in a total darkness. It was the middle of the afternoon, and Remus knew that there were usually windows in this corridor. And even at night, it was never this dark. Something was very wrong. Lumos, they both whispered, lighting their wand tips and holding them up, casting beams of white light across the grey flagstones, the blood-red tapestries, the glinting suits of armour. It seemed empty. 
Christopher took a brave step ahead of Remus, clearing his throat. <clears throat> Hello? Is, that, is anyone there? He called. No response, utter silence. Christopher turned around to look at Remus, squinting, and raised an arm to his eyes, against the brightness of Remus's wand. Perhaps you ought to go for a teacher. Come back with me then, Remus said. I... There was a noise, a nasty, crawling, slimy squelch, just ahead of Christopher. They both whipped around and aimed their lights at it, but found only an empty corner. Christopher's heart was pounding hard. He reeked of adrenaline and terror. There's something in here, he whispered fearfully. Come on, Rimmer said. Let's go, let's get help. I think it's over there. Christopher walked forward again, and Remus lost sight of him and had to go by smell. This was particularly disconcerting. Remus had never met a darkness so black that he could not see through it. Chris, he reached forward, casting his light about. I found it. It's... No! Oh, man! No! Christopher began to scream, somewhere further up the hall. Without thinking, Remus bolted forward following the terrible wails. Chris! He almost dripped over him. Christopher was curled up on the floor, hands covering his head, rocking and sobbing. What? Remus asked, trembling now, as Christopher pointed at it. Remus used his wand to follow his friend's shaky arm, and finally throwing light on their tormentor. Remus almost screamed too. A corpse. A horrible, rotting, shambling corpse. It was stumbling towards them through the velvet blackness. It stumbled forward with a heavy stoop, reaching for Christopher. The eyes were intact, yellow and red, both vacant and ravenous. It still had most of its skin, a grotesque palette of mottled grey and deep bruised purple. It moaned, a ghastly, rattling sound through crooked yellow teeth. Remus raised his wand and stood in front of Chris. He was about to fire a knockback jinx at it, the only thing he could think of in a short notice. When it fixed its hungry eyes on him, in a second, it vanished. Remus blinked, gasping, and suddenly the hallway was filled with a pale, milky light as a full moon rose before him. The scream died in his throat, and he was gripped with horror. How was it possible? The moon was not due for a week. He had to run, he had to get away from Christopher, but... Wait a minute. Ah, <gasps> I know what you are. Remus's terror turned to elation, as he raised his wand once more, and shouted confidently. Ridiculous! The moon began to expand and transform once more, this time into a huge white beach ball which began to bounce and spring off the walls before bursting into a cloud of soapy bubbles. Remus laughed, well, as loudly as he could under the circumstances, and the bogart retreated. He took his chance and grabbed Christopher, still curled up, eyes closed tight under the arm, and dragged him back to the archway as fast as he could. They came out of the other side gasping and blinking hard in the light. Christopher was gripping Remus's robes tightly, his breathing heavy, face ashen. Fuck, Remus murmured, feeling pretty shaky himself. That, 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 that was a bog art, Christopher stuttered. Yeah, yeah, it was. I've never seen one before, have you? Chris shook his head. Remus patted his hands, winning him to let go. Hey, it's okay. It wasn't real, remember? Come on. We have to tell someone, before everyone else runs into it. I'll, I'll go, Chris said, getting some of his courage back. I'll go now. Are you okay to wait here, in case someone comes? Of course, Remus nodded. No one's getting past me, he grinned, trying to make light of it. But Christopher was still too shaken. He nodded grimly and set off, still gripping his wand. Alone, Remus reached into his deep robe pockets and pulled out the Marauder's map. He had had it on him for a while now, out of concern that James might take a look one day and wonder why he and Sirius were sharing the bathroom so often. I solemnly swear that I'm up to no good, he whispered, tapping the parchment. The map immediately sprang to life, ink spreading like vines across the page. Remus held it up to his eyes and frantically searched for the corridor with the bog art. There it was, and there he was, Remus Lupin, clearly marked out at one end. He followed the length of it with his finger, 
It was completely empty. Apparently Bogarts did not show up. Not enough substance, maybe. He reached the end. There was a second archway on the other side, he remembered, covered by a tapestry. Three people were waiting there, quite still. Barty Crouch Jr., Garrick Mulsaber, and... Remus's stomach sank, though he was not at all surprised. Here it was, proof in black and white. Regulus Black. Chapter 124, Seventh Year, Christmas, Part 1. In a miserable twist of fate, the December 1977 full moon fell on Christmas Day. The marauders all agreed to stay at Hogwarts for the duration, with a plan to travel back to the Potters on Boxing Day. Lily made them all promise that they would meet up as soon as possible in Diagon Alley. It's the only place my parents will let me go by myself, she explained to Remus. I wanted to come to the Potters too, but they're protective and they haven't met James yet. Why not invite James to yours? Remus suggested. Lily bit her lip and shrugged. It's just a bit tricky. Maybe for Easter break. It was a cheerless Christmas, really. James was missing Lily. Peter obviously wished he was at home, not stuck at school. Sirius was anxious and jittery whenever he and Remus were in the same room with someone else. And Remus, himself, was grumpy and irritable, waiting for the moon to take hold. They didn't do anything very Christmassy either, other than go down for lunch with the other students who had stayed. They had promised Mrs Potter not to exchange gifts until they could all be together. I feel awful, Remus sighed as he wound his scarf around his neck, ready to head towards the shack ahead of his friends. You lot should be at home. I could have stayed by myself. Or we'll used your attic again, Prongs. Don't be silly, James shook his head manfully. I know how bad it is for you in the attic, tied down like that. The shack is the best place. At least we can all run around a bit. And he was right, of course. They all needed a good run, and in the morning Remus woke and looked up at his friend's rosy grinning faces and knew they all felt much better for it. They couldn't leave immediately, of course. Madame Pomfrey would not allow it. Remus was prescribed his usual morning of sleep, and he hoped that the other marauders had taken the opportunity to do the same. When he woke up in the infirmary, Sirius was sitting in the chair next to him, grinning, two suitcases at his feet. Ready when you are, he said cheerfully, and Remus felt a pang of guilt again. Sirius needed to get home to the Potters just as much as James did. Have you packed for me? Remus sat up, blinking. Blimey. <laughs> of course I haven't, Sirius snorted. Prongs did. And I made sure he got the book on your bedside table, though. Remus opened his mouth to speak, but Sirius raised a hand. And the one under your pillow. Don't worry, Mooney. Nothing gets past me. Cheers, Remus smiled. Just let me get dressed, then. Are you sure you'll be okay to flu? Sirius asked as Remus swivelled out of the bed, his bare feet landing on the cold flagstones. He felt a bit weak and woozy, but no worse than usual. He nodded. Yeah, apparated after a full moon once, remember? Okay, but you should say if you don't feel up to it. I will. Pass my jeans, will you? Sirius complied. Remus dressed slowly, checking his body with every stretch and turn, making sure everything was working as it should be. He was starving hungry, but willing to wait for Mrs Potter's cooking. Where are the others? Remus asked bending now to tie his shoelaces. Common room, Sirius replied. He held up his silver compact mirror. I'm going to let Prongs know that we're on our way to McGonagall's office. They'll meet us. Great, Remus nodded. He stopped for a moment, dizzy again, and pretended just to be stretching. Mooney? Mm Mm-hmm. Remus began to tie his second shoe, concentrating very hard, I'm going to tell Prongs over Christmas. What? He straightened up so suddenly that he had to grab Sirius's arm to stop him from wobbling over. His head swam and he blinked a few times while the equilibrium restored itself. Tell Prongs? Yeah. Sirius looked very pale, his eyes big. If it's okay with you, I I think I'd better. I mean, of course, yeah, I, I, I mean... 
Well, why now? Cyril shrugged. Something's got to give. And I'm mental about you. Remus's face grew hot and he looked away. He nudged Cyrus's toe with his own. Shut up. Never. Cyrus poked his tongue out. So, it's okay? Yeah, of course it is. Will you, will you let me know when? Definitely. I want to pick the right time. Okay. I'll go and get Pomfrey now, shall I? Cheers. And with that, Cyrus jumped up and disappeared behind the screen. Rumors sat still for a few minutes, stunned. Well, people could always surprise you. Boxing day afternoon with the Potters was a welcome change of pace. Euphemia wanted to know all about Lily, and Fleamont wanted to know how the new Gryffindor Quidditch lineup was working out. This led to a very long and involved argument between Peter, Sirius, James and his father as they complained about the poor new chaser, something Ericusson, and fretted over whether or not this would be the end to the Gryffindor's six-year winning streak. In the end, Remus and Euphemia abandoned them to this and went into the kitchen to help Gully with the washing up. Mrs Potter pulled up a seat for Remus by the sink and said, You just sit there, my love, and you can dry. Don't want you on your feet all evening. You'll never get up tomorrow. And it sounds like the boys have a lot planned. They worked away in companionable silence for a while. Remus practised several drying spells before giving up and just using a dishcloth. Maybe he would never be any good at domestic incantations. Comes with practice, Euphemia smiled. Her face was soft in the twinkle of the fairy lights, and though she looked tired and older than Remus had remembered her, she looked content and homely, just as a mother should look in his mind. Mrs Potter? Yes, dear. You you knew my dad, didn't you? Lyle? A little bit, but not well. Monty knew him better. Their paths crossed at the ministry once or twice and I believe they were both partial to a few Friday night pints at the Leaky Cauldron. She clucked her tongue indulgently. What about Ope? Euphemia set down the plate she was about to hand over and looked down at him. He swallowed. Hope Lupin, my mother. She was a muggle. Yes, I know, dear. I only met her once. But you met her. He stared at James's mother, amazed. Why had it never occurred to him before? She pulled off her bright yellow apron and sat down in the chair beside him. We were only introduced. We were both pregnant at the same time. That's the only reason I remember. She was a lot younger than me and, as you say, a muggle. We moved in very different circles, I suppose. Lyle was a very private man. What was she like? Remus asked desperately. Was she... Nice. Oh, Remus. Euphemia reached out and took his hand, which was cold from the dishes, and felt a bit too familiar. He didn't want to upset her, though, so he let her do it. She was very nice, from what I remember. Mousy little thing, blonde hair, and a lovely smile. Very small, I remember thinking, though, next to Lyle, anyone looked small. I don't remember what the occasion was, but we were both enormous. I remember her telling me she was expecting in March, and I told her to get in touch if she needed anything. But I'm afraid she never did. Perhaps she didn't know how to do it. Remus looked down. If he had made it through his childhood unscathed, perhaps in time his mother might have made more friends. Perhaps she would have befriended Mrs. Potter, and perhaps they would all have spent Christmases together. I was given a letter, Remus said slowly. When I turned seventeen, she wrote it, Hope, before giving me away. She she said in it that she might try and... That I might... I might try to find her. Is that what you would like? I don't know. Maybe she's changed her mind by now. Remus, Euphemia said very fiercely. I can promise you she hasn't. If you want to look for your mother... Then just give me the word. Monty can do it in a trice. Remus looked up, finally, and smiled. Thank you. He went to bed early, and was woken by Sirius creeping in under the covers. The house had grown very quiet 
and it was very dark outside. Sorry, Sirius whispered, smelling faintly of brandy, and warm all over as he wound his arms around Remus. Didn't mean to wake you up. Yeah, you did, Remus murmured sleepily. Haven't told Prongs then, yet? Nah. Sirius shook his head against Remus's arm, burrowing his face under the duvet. I thought tomorrow, after Diagon Alley, before dinner. Okay, Remus sighed, closing his eyes and settling back to sleep. Just before he drifted off, he whispered, You better set an alarm or something, then, so you can get back to your own bed before... But no, Cyrus had fallen sound asleep. Tuesday the 27th of December, 1977 Come on, come on, hurry up! James was bellowing up the stairs as Remus searched for his woolly hat. Calm down, you lunatic, we're almost ready! Cyrus yelled back from the landing, where he was rearranging his parting in the full-length mirror. No shouting in the house, boys! Euphemia called from the kitchen. I can't find it. Did you pack it? Remus huffed, hanging off his door frame. I told you, I left packing to Prongs. Oi, Prongs, you forgot Mooney's hat, you bastard! I asked you to help me, James shouted back. You said I had everything under control. Well, I assumed you did. Sorry, Mooney. It's okay, Prongs. Remus joined in, a bit embarrassed. I'll go without, he said. It's not that cold. Have mine, Sirius shrugged, tossing his head again, still eyeing himself in the mirror. I don't want to muck up my hair anyway. Accio hat. Sirius's red woollen hat, emblazoned with a Gryffindor lion, came shooting out of the rubbish tip he called a bedroom, and Remus grabbed it from the air and rammed it down on his head. Okay, let's go. Finally! James met them at the bottom of the stairs, where he'd been waiting for a good half an hour now. Where's Wormtail? Sent an owl. Doesn't feel like it, apparently. Grumpy git. Yeah. Well, for once I don't blame him for not wanting to flew to London on a winter's day just to see you and Evans snog, Sirius teased. That's not all we do, James's ears turned red. Anyway, if that's true, why are you and Mooney coming? I want some new books, and he's a voyeur, Remus shrugged. Come on, let's go, shall we? Remus remembered to keep his eyes and mouth closed this time, and liked to think that he arrived in the fireplace of the leaky cauldron with some dignity, even if he had tripped over the cast-iron gate. Luckily, he stumbled straight into Lily's arms as she'd been waiting anxiously for their arrival. Oof! Staggering, but just about keeping upright. Hi, Remus. Hi, he laughed, getting his own balance. My hero. Too late, Prongs. Cyrus said, brushing himself off as he stepped neatly over the gate. You've lost her to a better man already. It was inevitable, I suppose, James grinned, following him out. Lily let go of Remus immediately and flung herself at James, who looked thrilled to bits. They managed to find a table to sit at in the crowded pub and ordered four butter beers. Busy, isn't it? Remus said, raising his voice over the din as he pushed through the throngs of shoppers with the drinks. Sales! Lily said casually. Oxford Street's just as bad. I was there with Mum this morning. Anyone here we know? Cyrus asked, raising his head to look about. Um, not really. Ooh, uh, I did see Frank earlier. Do you remember Frank Longbottom? He was head boy in our first year. Lily said, before ducking her head and focusing on her drink, and James's hand, which was on her hip and snaking slowly underneath her green wool jumper. Once they had finished their drinks, they were all keen to get out of the noisy, overwarm pub and into the fresh air. The street, however, was just as packed. It seemed to Remus that the entire wizarding population of Britain must be crammed into these few crooked streets, all wrapped up in heavy winter robes, carrying bags and baskets and boxes, cheerily wishing each other Merry Christmas, or else rudely barging through the hustle and bustle just to get to the shop they wanted. Try to stay together! James threw over his shoulder at Remus and Sirius, before promptly disappearing into the throng with Lily. Uh, let's just do our shopping and find them later, Sirius huffed. 
Did you say you wanted books? Yeah, Remus nodded, distracted. Can you smell that? Smell what? Sirius asked, pulling Remus's robes in the direction of Flourish and Blots. Remus followed, but sniffed the air again. The trouble was, it was so hard to describe a scent, even to Sirius, whose own canine attributes sometimes surfaced even when he was in human form. <sighs> I don't know, he said lamely. It just smells different than last time. The magic. It's probably all these people. You can smell magic? Oh, yeah, I can. Bloody hell. The bookshop was manic, but Remus didn't mind. He would have been content to wander the shelves all day, row by row, picking through and reading blurbs and stroking covers. He was having the best afternoon he'd had in ages, until he was interrupted. Well, well. Look who it is. Remus looked up and saw Snape standing only a few metres away. He reeked of silver, so Remus stayed back. Would you want, Snivellus? He tutted, pretending to be unconcerned, returning to the book he was looking at. You and your little band of delinquents might think you own the school, loony lupin, Severus tutted. But you do not have any claim on Diagon Alley. I'm allowed to shop wherever I like. Well, piss off and shop then, Remus shrugged, turning away. He was starting to feel sick, and he wanted Snape and whatever he was hiding under his robes gone. You're in my way, Snape narrowed his cold black eyes. He began to advance on Remus, reaching over his shoulder for a potions book. Remus's hands began to shake, so he put his book down and moved away, shoving his hands inside his pockets. Where was Sirius? Feeling all right, loony, Snape smiled maliciously. <coughs> what are you doing with that much silver on you, you freak? Remus choked leaning back on the bookcase behind him, his eyes watering. One can't be too careful. You get all sorts round here. All right, Snivellus. Sirius's voice came from just behind them. Remus sighed with relief as Snape reeled back, looking as though he'd been caught stealing. Sirius stepped out from behind the bookcase, arms folded. Get lost on your way to Nocturne Alley, did you? Or maybe just in town for your annual hair wash? Ugh, piss off, black. Oh, please, after you. Cyrus made a sweeping bow, allowing Severus to stalk off, mumbling darkly to himself. Remus chuckled weakly. Oh, thanks, he said. You okay? Mm, better not to worry him about the silver. Probably Snape just being his usual revolting self. Fine, Remus smiled. Come on. Let's go find the other, shall we? Don't you want to buy your books? Nah. Remy shook his head. I just wanted to make a note of the names, see if Pince will order them into the school library for me. Free that way. Oh, fair enough. Come on then, mad in here. They had to push most of their way outside, and once they were out, Remus needed a breather, and had to stop and lean against the wall in the alleyway beside the shop. Are you sure you're okay? Sirius asked, tugging a lock of his hair anxiously. Oh, I'm fine, Remus breathed, nodding again. The sickly feeding was receding now, he just needed a minute. Just the moon, probably. Still tired. What did Snivellus want? Oh, the usual nonsense. Remus screwed up his face. I don't think he meant to bump into me. What's Nocturne Alley? Over there. Sirius nodded to the street in the other alleyway, slightly wider than the one they were standing in, which clearly led to more shops. It's where the dodgier types hang out. Dark wizards, banshees in disguise, vampires, that sort of thing. Oh. And werewolves. Remus knew this instantly. There was a very faint scent. Now he knew where to look. Someone who'd been there recently. Not Livia. James's dad was telling me they're planning on raiding some of the shops in the new year. Reckon they're stocking illegal supplies. Bet you anything that's where Snivel is stuck off to. Remus stared at Nocturne Alley for a while, as he caught his breath. Whatever the strange new scent was, it was coming from there. 
He'd smelled something like it before, from Moody. Dark magic, burnt around the edges, charred flesh. He shivered. Quality Quidditch supplies, he suggested. If James is anywhere, he'll be there. Good shout, Cyrus nodded. Let's go then. They left the shadowy alleyway and stepped out into the bright winter sunshine. It hadn't snowed this year, but it was still bitterly cold and the sky was clear, making the air fresh and crisp with energy. As they crossed the road, slowly past the gaggle of witches shopping with their children, the wizards shopping to pass the time of day, and house elves running errands for their masters, the energy seemed to change slightly. It made the hair on Remus's neck stand up, like the arrival of a predator. He tensed and looked around. He caught sight of Lily and James looking at the latest broom in the window of quality Quidditch supplies. He was about to turn and get Sirius' attention when it happened. Bang! The front of the leaky cauldron exploded in a plume of thick, blood-red smoke, bricks and wood and glass flying out onto the street. There was barely a microsecond of sun silence before the screams started, wails of pain and terror and shock. The chaos around them seemed to expand and contract, like a crashing wave. Many people were apparating around them. They were all leaving, but some were arriving too. These were the ones that made something deep inside Remus want to start growling. Bang! Another shot further up the street exploded too. Then another, and... Get down! Sirius full body tackled Remus to the ground as they both covered their faces as quality Quidditch supplies went up in smoke. End of chapter 124